Please welcome to the stage the lead for our next spotlight session, the Senior Director of Global Partnerships <laughs> yes, yes. and Networks for the Julianne Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory at Arizona State University, Amanda Ellis. Enga mana, enga reo, enga rangatiratanga. Greetings in Māori, the indigenous language of my birth island, Aotearoa, New Zealand. This greeting recognizes all of you as the important leaders that you are. And as we just heard from Catherine, action. And thank you all for the incredible action you're taking. Tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa. And why do we traditionally use that greeting three times? One, for all of you who are present in the room. Two, to honor our ancestors. And three, to think forward seven generations to our youth. What an incredible morning. I don't know about you, but I'm on cloud nine. What an inspirational set of speakers and addresses from the wisdom of our planetary guardians, Sylvia Earle, Sir David Attenborough, Shie Bastida, to <coughs> the indigenous wisdoms from the Pacific and from the Amazon, to our youth leaders, brilliant scientists, Johan Rockström, Peter Schlosser, and the inimitable Catherine Hayhoe, and to national and global leaders. Thank you all so much for the work that you are doing. Our most recent panel talked about the values we need for systems change. <coughs> and I'm very honored to introduce two extremely powerful men, and I hopefully one woman who's on her way in traffic, who are doing extraordinary work in influencing their constituencies. So I'd like to welcome to the stage, and I will introduce them more fulsomely, but I would like to welcome to the stage the Secretary General of the Interparliamentary Union, Martin Chungung. And the Secretary General of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Sh Association, Wait, yeah. Stephen Twigg. Now these are two extremely powerful men. They represent pretty extraordinary constituencies. And I'm going to turn first to Martin and invite him to talk to us about the work that he does leading the Interparliamentary Union, which comprises 179 member countries out of the 193 of the UN. It is the world's oldest multilateral body. And Martin himself represents a double first, the first non-European and the first African to serve as Secretary General for the IPU. He also chairs the International Gender Champions right across the UN system. And when I served as ambassador to the UN in Geneva and was very active in this movement, Martin was such an incredible ally and in fact became a close friend who has visited my home country of Aotearoa, New Zealand and has been the inaugural <coughs> Julianne Wrigley Global Futures recipient of the Gender Champion Award as well. Very, very important. And so we're delighted to have worked on gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls together and now to be collaborating on the IPU global campaign, my parliament, my planet, our shared global future. So Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Amanda, my very good friend, Amanda. Uh, we're doing such great work together and uh, I really appreciate your commitment to uh, what we have to do together to address the uh, global uh, uh, issues that uh, are facing us all uh, today. And I wish to thank you and uh, the Gillian 
uh, Wrigley Foundation Global Futures Lab of Arizona State University for the privilege of addressing this audience here. I think it's important that uh, together we continue to forge our own vision for what we can do to address the global challenge of uh, climate change. If we were uh, kids in this room today, I would say that climate change has become the bogeyman of the world. <laughs> We're also scared of what uh, climate is doing to us. And uh, on that account, we have to reassure generations uh, that the world has it within its powers to make a difference, to reverse the trend. And I speak to you today to bring you the uh, parliamentary perspective to this conversation because it is important. We speak, with, we speak on behalf of a constituency that has the powers legally, constitutionally, to take action to reverse the trend of climate action. And our role in the IPU, thank you for introducing the IPU so elogiously, uh, Amanda. We are this global outfit that has to forge an alliance between parliaments around the world to make a difference, to help us address global concerns. Parliaments don't exist just because the Constitution ordains them to uh, exist. They have to make a difference in the lives of the people. And for me, I think that when it comes to addressing the compelling uh, threat of uh, climate change, there are two uh, streams of action that parliaments need to take. First of all, parliaments as legislators have it within their powers to make laws, to forge policies, take decisions that can help us achieve sustainability, that can help us achieve resilience and just reduce carbon emissions, for example. It's in all the uh, uh, constitutions of the world, most countries of the world, that parliaments have the law making capacity. And Catherine, Catherine, when you spoke, you talked about holding politicians to account. And of course, parliaments have within them the function of oversight, oversight of government policies to make sure that they are consistent with uh, standards of efficacy, they are consistent with the interests of the people across the board. And so this is something that we are in the IPU trying to do to help parliaments to exercise that oversight function very carefully. And of course, the third stream is uh, budget allocation. We're talking about climate action. It comes with a cost. And we're talking about these resources coming from the private sector and other philanthropic uh, sectors. But governments through parliaments can allocate their own resources to uh, make sure that we are addressing efficiently the issue of uh, climate change. And then, on the other hand, Parliaments are supposed to mirror society, right? They are supposed mm -hmm. to be representative of society. And we do think that it is important for them to take action that addresses the whole gamut of the interests of society, not only particular groups. And the SDG mantra is leave no one behind, right? And parliaments, parliaments have that role to ensure that no one is left behind because they represent all of society. And so what do we do in the IPU? I think in the IPU, you mentioned, uh, uh, Amanda, the campaign. Thank you very much for, I think I just saw the agreement between uh, ASU and the IPU this morning, uh, helping us uh, implement a strong campaign, the plan, uh, Parliament for the Planet uh, campaign, which is intended to continue to create awareness of the compelling constraints of climate change spurring parliamentary action and making sure that we're all working towards mitigating uh, the climate uh, crisis. And then we also want not only to create awareness, because it's good, we, I think we've done a lot of creating awareness. Well, it is prefer, important for us to spur action. To totally we know to what works, we know the solutions that are out there, and we want parliaments to help implement those uh, solutions through the uh, uh, functions that they have uh, on account of their constitutions. And so we are with uh, uh, Amanda and ASU 
working to build those capacities in Parliament to bring tools that we know, solutions that we know, to the attention of Parliament and encouraging them to implement this within their uh, uh, structures, within their business uh, practices. And I just want to mention one thing about inclusivity. Uh, our action cannot be seen to be fully efficient and legitimate if our business model, our business practices are seen to be uh, imbalanced, not representative. If you don't have women and men at the table, you don't have young people being empowered to give their own voices to the global conversation of climate change. And that is an area where the IP is focusing attention today. We are building parliaments that are more representative, more legitimate, because they're having more and more women, and they're having more and more young people in, the, in their representation. I just came from uh, Vietnam, where we had the conference of, a global conference of young parliamentarians, and that is the message we are saying. It is not normal that you have a population where uh, young people account for maybe 60% uh, of the global population, but they, have, they account for only 3% in parliamentary membership. It's not on. It cannot be legitimate. So for us, the message is, if you want to be legitimate, if you want climate action to be legitimate, it has to be inclusive. Let me conclude by uh, saying, uh, Amanda, that we will continue to work on advocacy. Uh, we uh, see ourselves as bridge builders between uh, government and uh, the society. We're having this conversation on the west side of Manhattan. On the east side, you have heads of state and government hmm. and other senior officials having speeches upon speeches in the general debate. And I think that our role in the IPU as the global organization of parliaments is to help us take the conversation that we're having in here, which is focused on practical solutions, on things that work, on our own legitimate vision for global action on climate change, is for us to take this message from the west side to the east side, where the governments are meeting at this particular change. I think that it's important that that conversation take place. Otherwise, we will be following parallel tracks and efficiency will be lost. So thank you very much for this opportunity to take this uh, conversation forward. And I, let me go back to what Catherine said, quoting uh, from the Intergovernmental uh, Inter Panel on Climate Change. Every action counts, and every action by parliaments by legislators across the world count. Is that not true, Hank? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Martin. Bridge building from the west to the east is so important, and I am thrilled that from the east to the west, an hour and a half in traffic, we have my <laughs> wonderful friend with us, uh, who is the first ever one of, in fact, one of only four women since the founding of the United Nations to serve as president of the UN General Assembly, Maria Fernanda Espinosa Garces. So, now, I think Martin's comments really do show how important it is. It's only 20 minutes to walk, but in traffic, it's an hour and a half. Yes. So Maria has so many, she wears so many hats. She co-chairs the coalition for the UN we need, bringing her expertise as the first woman defense minister and as foreign minister in Ecuador, as ambassador to the UN in both Geneva, where we collaborated, and New York and also managing connected women leaders globally. So Maria is a force for change, and we're so thrilled that you battled the traffic and that, uh, that disconnect between East and West to, to be with us today. So thrilled to have you. And Maria, we were, was just recapping the extraordinary morning we had and the fact that this panel is really the culmination of what we heard from brilliant scientists, from youth leaders, from Planetary Guardians, Sir David Attenborough, Sylvia Earle, Indigenous youth leader Shia Bastida, that this brings it all together for systems change. 
what do we need to see in a reformed UN and how is it that parliaments who are the voice of the people can help really create change at the systems level. So we're so looking forward to having you. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Amanda, for such a generous introduction. My apologies for, for being late. My number one point is going to be about pl public transportation <laughs> and urban planning. <laughs> well, but I'm, I'm really thrilled to be uh, uh, once again at this Global Futures Conference and in the company of uh, you know amazing, amazing co-panelists, Stephen and, and my, my dear brother and friend, Martin uh, Shungong. And, and I think you mentioned, Amanda, the word reform. In, in I think that uh, when you go across the street, don't go now because, yeah, no now, but uh, at some point, uh, don't go now. Uh, I have my notes here, I have a very nice speech. I, I just, uh, you know, the, my the speech is up here for a while. So uh, basically, as far as I recall, which is about 25 years ago, we've been talking about UN reform and the UN needs to be reformed. And uh, they, there has been so many efforts, uh, like band-aid approaches, uh, improving the management, improving the way the UN delivers on the ground, which is very good. And, uh, you know, making, I would say, incremental baby steps to improve the organization. But here, now, we, we are facing a world that is completely different as the world we had uh, after the Second World War. And I have the impression that a, the old system and the old model a, has completely, you know, failed to respond uh, to the, 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 the needs of today, to the challenges of today. And it's falling apart in a way. And we are in a situation when we are building, reimagining the future. And that transition has a cost and is difficult. You know, I'm a, I'm a stubborn optimist, as, as like Kofi Annan used to say, but uh, I, I think, first of all, we need to understand collectively where we want to go, including the UN. And there are many efforts, uh, many documents, an excellent report from the Secretary General that emerged from the, the 75th anniversary uh, which is called the Our Common Agenda. There are several reports out there, policy briefs, uh, how to improve the United Nations. And, and, and I think that, uh, and I was listening, I was at the Global People's Assembly the other day and, and uh, what I heard, the common denominator was deeds, not words. You know, we have to act, not only words. And people was, were very excited and I have to tell you, we need to talk. We need the words. We need the narratives. We need to understand. We, we need to have a shared understanding of where we want to go. And diplomacy, you know, even if it, it, it can, you know, look, you know, boring to us, and, but diplomacy is precisely that. The UN is precisely that. It's the place where you process dissent is the place where you talk to the people that don't think the same as you and you find common denominators. And at this point in time, I feel after 20 plus years of being connected to the UN, I have the, the feeling, it's, it's a perception, a strong perception, but you know, with some facts that we have a once in a century, you know, to make changes that are going to last. And it's beyond, and, and today I just came to listening to the Secretary General in the opening of the General Assembly. He said, we need a new agenda for peace. Yes, we do. Uh, we need a new digital compact. Yes, we do. We need a declaration on the rights of future generations. Yes, we do. All of this together. But we also need an umbrella, an overarching idea that we need a global universal organization, institution, that puts before anything else the first phrase of the UN Charter, the with the people's part of it. Yeah. And 
we are the we the peoples. And in basically the problems, the difficulties, the challenges of, of, of the UN is, uh, one of them is, you know, a huge profound implementation deficit. Every year the General Assembly passes, during my year I remember 370 something resolutions. And in between, you know, conventions, in between the Pact on Migration, uh, the Pact on, on Refugees, etc. And our me accountability mechanisms are extremely weak. So the issue of implementation, the issue of inclusiveness and legitimacy, uh, and also the issue of the democratic scaffold of the organization itself. Uh, perhaps it's easier for Martin because the way parliaments work, it's a little easier. And, and I think that uh, not only we are going from a bipolar or so-called bipolar world to a much more complex polycentric world. People talk about multipolarity, but I would say, you know, polycentric, many centers, and the need to weave unity. And just to close, because I'm over my, my five minutes, uh, I, I would say, you know, that we need a roadmap. We do have some commitments. The summit of the future, uh, the, the, the SDG summit this year, they delivered a political declaration which is ambitious, and I hope it really is the basis to scale up finance and, and, and that the, the countries need to scale, to really rethink the international financial architecture and to push hard for the SDGs. We have the summit of the future, once in a generation opportunity to make the changes that are needed uh, from the coalition for the, uh, the UN we need, from global women leaders, the organization, organization I lead, we're pushing hard to have a meaningful summit of the future. And number three, we will have in 2025 a, a social summit as well, because without people, there is no global social contract that we can draft. So I think that, and from my perspective, we need a new global contract based in unity within diversity and understanding that we need to heal and reconnect the relationship between societies, economies, nature, and politics. What a beautiful summary of our morning, and you weren't even here. Brilliant. Thank you, thank you so much, Maria. And I think that's a beautiful segue to our closing speaker, the need for shared understanding and how important that is. So it's now my great honor to introduce Stephen Twigg, who, having served as a politician in Britain with special expertise in education, is now leading the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association with 180 branches worldwide including both national and sub-national. So I'm not going to steal your thunder, <laughs> but Stephen is here to launch a very special initiative that we have been delighted to support and be part of. Thank you. Amanda, uh, thank you very much indeed, and good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's a great uh, pleasure uh, to be here and to share the stage with Amanda, Maria, and Martin, but also uh, I think more significantly for me to have been here and listening to the voices uh, through today, the voices from indigenous leaders, from youth leaders, from scientists and others. It has been a truly inspiring morning, but I think also a very challenging morning, certainly for me and I think for Martin, in terms of representing the parliaments of the world. And that's really what I want to talk briefly about today. I want to start by reflecting on something that David Attenborough said in his uh, film at the beginning of the conference earlier on this morning. And he spoke about the challenge of thinking long term, of seeing the big picture. And I think politics and parliaments find that especially challenging as they're often tied into short term priorities, the electoral cycle, we're in a world of increasing polarization. And I'm really pleased that Maria referred to the Summit of the Future next year because I think that gives us an opportunity to build upon the discussions that have happened this week, including at the Sustainable Development Goals Summit, to really think about some of those key longer term challenges that have been addressed so powerfully here today. 
My focus is about the Sustainable Development Goals. Eight years ago, the leaders of the world came together here in New York to adopt Agenda 2030. And we've already heard today about how difficult that is proving to take forward. I think it was Rigoberto in the youth panel spoke about the Millennium Development Goals, and we know that they made a great deal of progress. But the point of Agenda 2030 is to go beyond simply a focus on poverty reduction in the poorest countries to addressing our shared challenges that are universal to address poverty, inequality, and the climate emergency. As Amanda said, the Commonwealth Parliament Parliamentary Association brings together the legislatures of the Commonwealth, both at a national and a sub-national level. And like our friends at the IPU, we are about a voice for parliaments, but also promoting mutual learning amongst our members. And that is why two years ago, we launched an online parliamentary academy to support both elected members and staff in parliaments to increase their levels of knowledge and skills across a whole range of areas. And I'm delighted that today, here at this conference, we are launching our new course on SDGs a Parliament's role. Martin has already set out very uh, fully the role of Parliaments with regard to climate change and sustainable development, and I echo everything really that he said about that. Parliamentarians, I think, have both a responsibility in terms of climate change and sustainable development, but an also an opportunity. Parliamentarians need to both be held to account, but also hold others to account, whether that is governments, multilateral institutions, multinational companies. And we know that the global goals speak to the sorts of challenges that are being addressed at this conference. For parliaments, SDG 16, about peaceful, inclusive societies. For this conference, of course, SDG 13, on climate action. And as we've heard through the discussions today, the importance of SDGs 4 and 5 on education and gender equality. So our course includes practical advice and information for parliaments, drawing upon positive case studies from Commonwealth parliaments. We heard very powerfully today from the former president of Mauritius, how the small island states are at the forefront of the struggle against climate change. And our course highlights examples from Seychelles, where a blue bond was issued to fund conservation and the protection of marine life. We know that food security is a huge issue globally, and our course highlights the approach taken in Kenya to ensure collaboration at all levels of government to promote food security and the important role that Parliament has in that. And thirdly, we've heard a lot today about evidence and data. Data, 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 a must do, the theme of this conference, a must do for progress on the sustainable development goals. And we showcase in our course the SDG Center for Africa and its crucial work to modernize and improve data collection. The final point that I want to make here today is that of course I believe that parliaments and parliamentarians have a critical role to play and there's so much more they need to do to address the climate emergency and Agenda 2030. But they cannot do these things on their own. They have their relationship, of course, to governments, to civil society and citizens, including young people, business and academia. And it will only be by the coming together of all of those different social forces that we will see the progress that all of us I hear here at this conference I know want us to achieve. Working together, acknowledging the scale of the challenge, but also I hope in the context of this mid point of the Sustainable Development Goals and this week's SDG Summit, rededicating ourselves to those global goals. And that is why we are launching our Academy course today. We're immensely grateful to the organizers of this conference for enabling us to do so. And those of you who've signed up to attend will be meeting from 1 p.m. in room 412 for the official launch of our program. Those of you who can't, you can sign up to our academy via the CPA website, cphq.org 
But above all, I'm just so immensely grateful to be part of this incredibly exciting and inspiring conference here in New York today. Thank you very much and have a successful conference. Thank you all so much. A really inspiring close to an amazing morning. Here we have the architecture for ensuring that we do take action forward. So thank you for the incredible work all of you are doing. I think we are waiting for the voice of God now to tell us where lunch will be. <laughs>